I'd like to introduce my friend Todd. Todd Shalom works with text, sound, and image to recontextualize the body in space using vocabulary of the everyday. He is the founder and director of Elastic City. In this role, Todd leads his own walks, collaborates with artists to lead joint walks, and works with artists in a variety of disciplines to adapt their expertise to the, to the participatory walk format. He often collaborates with performance artist slash director Nigel Smith. Together they conceive and stage interactive performances in public and private environments. Todd is also a ringleader of Willing Participant. Willing Participant whips up urgent poetic responses to crazy shit that happens. Todd's work has been presented by organizations such as Abrams Art Center, Creative Times, Issue Project Room, The Kitchen, The Museum of Modern Art, The New Museum, PS 122, and Printed Matter. He is a graduate and MFA writing program at California College of the Arts and also holds a BS in Business Administration from Boston University. Todd is a member of the core faculty in Pratt Institute, new MFA in writing. Please welcome Todd. Hi. Thanks to Cranbrook Studio Council and our Thoreau's for bringing me here. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the participatory walk and how I landed on it or in it, and uh, we'll talk about Elastic City. So I guess first, um, as Ara mentioned, I started off in business school, undergrad. I didn't really want to be there, um, and I studied marketing. Uh, this was something I was kind of pushed into and then kind of landed in the music industry. And I was working at companies like uh, Ryko Disc and CMJ and Sony Music. And I had this moment, um, well, it was like I was coming out at the time too, and, and I was like, I don't, I don't want to work for the artist. Like, I, I want to be the artist. Um, and writing was my way in. So I ended up uh, applying for an MFA over at California College of the Arts and for poetry. And so, this is actually kind of notes from a poem. The text is really small, but I thought I'd read it <clears throat> to give some context. All right, man up. Even his sneeze is rectangular. No sign, silly spot, an unironic high five, both in different stripes, tied and seafaring. It creeps, biz, owner, grown, trophy. Why don't you find it for yourself? My own chainmail butcher glove forms to hand and emphasizes the sound of wood. Man up and let your lips touch my cheek upon hello. I know you're more than different and interesting. This vocabulary is useless when fluent. Man up, it's time to write in our vote, poetry for once. Pinned down outside the embassy in love, whose swing gates make for great escapes, a custom home entertainment center that fits and frames all electronics perfectly. And so in studying poetry, you know, I would read my poems and then that would kind of be it. You know, I wasn't having a poetic dialogue. I really wanted it. Um, and so I started thinking, you know, being that I had this experience in music, I thought about, well, maybe I can explore text in music. And so I started doing research and, um, and stumbled on the work of, of Robert Ashley who actually just passed away within the past year. And he would do kind of like new opera. Uh, and, and I got really into his work and I was taking some courses over at Mills uh, in Oakland. And I ran into this guy on campus who, well he actually told me about Robert Ashley. 
And I picked up um, an issue of Wire magazine, the music magazine out of the UK, and they had an article on him. And then right afterwards, there was an article on acoustic ecology. And acoustic ecology is like the study of the environment through its sound or through sound. And so they would lead people on walks. Uh, and these would be walks like, like active listening walks. Like are the sounds we're listening to, are they caused by people? Are they caused by something technological? Are they caused by something else in nature? And like, how does that ratio change as we move from place to place? And so I became really interested in, in this idea of like giving these kinds of walks. And so I took their techniques and developed my own. And uh, in 2003, uh, led my first walk in San Francisco. And it was a sound walk. Um, so I kept doing these sound walks. And at the same time, I, I was just enjoying kind of being more vulnerable, letting myself be more vulnerable, uh, posing for photographers. Um, and it's kind of nuts. This is maybe a longer story. I don't know if I need to get into it. But uh, I, was, um, I was in Argentina. And um, I went down to visit. And I went to give a walk. I wrote to like a few different galleries saying, like, hi, I'm coming. I'm going to lead a walk. All I really needed was someone to promote it. And, uh, and one gallery, like they bit, and they were like, all right, come give, us, come give a walk. So this, this girl RSVP'd for a walk, and she said, you should go to this cafe in Palermo. I think you'd like it. So I did. And I'm sitting at this communal table, and, uh, and two guys walk in. And they sit down. I'm like writing in my journal. And one goes, like, take Conosco. Like, I recognize you from your photo. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> and so my friend in Brooklyn, Paul Sapuya, is a photographer. And he had taken my photo and put it on his website. And this guy had recognized me. Um, and as it turned out, he was a, an architect. And he designed this store. And I made a list of places I wanted to see in Argentina. And this store was on my list. It was crazy. So we became fast friends. Um, and I recorded sounds in him and his partner's uh, apartment. And then like a month later, I get a call from them that they wanted to use the sounds for the boyfriend's fashion show. He's a well-known designer down there, Martin Chorba. And so a month later, I flew down to Argentina and like sponsored by the phone company that was paying for the fashion show. And I was like, I have good luck here. Like, let me see what happens. So I ended up moving down to Argentina. And during this time, you know, I'm still writing poems. I'm giving walks. And I start to get into like interactive installations uh, using sensors like Max MSP, Jitter, and, um, and, and basically working with an Argentinian programmer to try and program these sensors. And my Spanish is not great. And there were so many decisions to make with this technology. And I was, <laughs> I was getting really frustrated um, that I was like, maybe I should just like, scrap technology altogether. Um, it just seems to be a headache. And I don't know if I want to sit behind a computer all day. And so uh, I'm living down there. And at this point, I, I was also traveling, too. Um, and so I went to Machu Picchu. And I'm in Cusco. And I have like altitude sickness. And I know that I have to return back to New York in a few months. Uh, that's where I'm from. And I thought, well, how can I continue to, like, what's going to make me money? Um, how can I continue to push upon my work? I need one big project. I'm kind of spread amongst like a few different things. And so I thought, well, like, what do I like to do? Um, and then how can I continue the spirit of traveling when I'm back at home? And so I thought about the walks. And I thought, well, I really like that. So, but I'm sick of giving sound walks. So I decided uh, to start Elastic City with the idea that I would work with artists and help take them from their primary discipline and help bring them essentially their tools, talents, like expertise, to the walk form. And so uh, I returned home. My friends in Argentina were like, great, this, this sounds like a great idea. You should launch it in the spring. <laughs> and I was like, like, I'm not ready to do that. Uh, I needed to take some time. So I really thought of Elastic City as a project. Um, and so I took time and worked with friends of mine who are designers to really get together the website. The website was like the public face of this. So we thought about having a logo, for instance, that changes, um, and, and really like laid out the website. 
and put it together. Um, and that was, so during 2009, I was working on that. And in 2010, uh, we started. And I really think that like the designer, the designers did, did a really good job, um, which helped us get our publicist, um, which helped us get press. So I kind of, it's like, we can talk about it later, but uh, I think that like marketing is part of the art and you can ignore it and let someone else do the marketing for you or you can embrace it. Um, and so given that I had this like business school background, I was like, all right, like this whole thing is a project and it's now taking the form of, well, at first a company. I had no business plan for this. Um, I wanted to make the walks ideally like accessible to everyone, but <laughs> I had a friend who went to Columbia like business school and he was like, all right, um, he, he came up with like this whole model for everything. And I still didn't understand how it would work unless we charged like $200 a person per walk. <laughs> this, is, this is paying the artists, the artists get paid to give walks. So I, I really had no idea how this was gonna work, but I knew that I had to do it um, because I know that if I just kind of sit on ideas, they're gonna, they're gonna flounder. So, so Elastic City started in 2010. Um, and I should just tell you kind of the, about the participatory walk form. The intention really is to make the audience active participants in an ongoing poetic exchange with the places we live in and visit. So the walks are participatory and they may rely on like se sensory based techniques, uh, the creation of new folk rituals uh, or other artist derived exercises to explore oneself, the group and a given space. And so it brings people together in new ways and it's decidedly not fact based. That's like a tour, and I call these things walks. So, um, in a typical walk, I should say, the typical walk is like 90 minutes, um, but we've had a walk that I'll show you a video later that was 56 hours. Um, and it's essentially like a set of reveals and prompts, like prompts or like invitations to do something. Um, it's like a series of activities or exercises or events that are tied to a given concept. Uh, and so it usually holds around 12 people, but that's variable. We just had a walk that held 50. Um, from the artist, I need a description. Uh, it needs to be like vague enough that they have room in between the time that I need that information and the time they give the walk and like compelling enough that it grips people we need a starting point, but you don't need to tell people the ending point. I need to know what language it's gonna be in, um, or if they speak another language. A compelling, a compelling photo, any video for promotion, and then anything else that, the, that people need to know. Anything miscellaneous, should they bring something? Uh, generally though, when you ask someone to bring something, they don't, <laughs> or you can't count on it, especially if they don't know you. So um, most of the walks are outside, uh, and if they're inside, you have to think about like, is it worth getting permission? So I should say that like, the other reason I started this was that I didn't, wanna, I didn't want curators to have to like, okay me. I didn't wanna have to answer to anyone. And the idea is, well, it's like, if, I, if I'm creating stuff outside, then like, all we need is good weather, you know? If that, and we've also had rain walks, but, um, so, so in 2010 we started, and basically I started to ask people I knew. Um, the first kind of set of artists I asked were people I knew, because I didn't really know what I was asking them. Uh, so we had 11 artists uh, lead walks through New York with one set of walks in Buenos Aires. And, um, and we launched with a walk in the town I grew up in, uh, Orangeburg, New York. And we moved when I was nine and it happened to correspond with like the 25th anniversary of the day that, uh, that, we mo that we moved. And so I created this walk for four people. The intention would be that my immediate family who would go on the walk and then like one by one, they all canceled. So, um, you know, my dad had to work. My mom was like, it's raining. My sister's like, I don't know. So, <laughs> so I went by myself. And I just took this walk. I, I drove out to the neighborhood, which was about 45 minutes from, from New York, uh, kind of upstate a little bit. 
on the border of New York, New Jersey. And, um, and it, was this, it was weather that was kind of similar to today, except without the rain. And, uh, and I walked around, and it was unreal. Um, I actually made my way to the house, which had been painted and like extended. Um, and then I actually, as I was about to leave, I ran into, I, I, I rang the bell and no one answered. And then as I was leaving, um, I ran into like the two girls that live there, like the daughters. And I was like, shit, like what do I do? I'm like, I'm like some, I'm like, I used to live here, you know? And they're just thinking like, who's this freak? And like, we don't want him like, you know, coming into the house. And uh, I didn't go into the house. I think just knowing that, knowing that like I maybe could have gone into the house or maybe I could have gone to the backyard, I don't know. But I didn't need to, I got like close enough. Um, so that was a walk I just needed to do for me. It wasn't really high concept, it was just like, it was just the beginning of this. I needed to start from a real personal place. Um, and so, um, so that was the first walk. And then that season, uh, there's something called Brooklyn Flea in New York which is, uh, it's like a flea market with artisan, you know, vendors that sell artisanal stuff. And um, they gave us a free booth for the season. And so like once a month, we would be able to showcase uh, Elastic City in some way. So we kind of used it as an opportunity to promote. So we gave out information burgers here. And, um, and we had like a photo booth. We realized that in, in giving out postcards, they w it wouldn't translate to people going online. Like you give someone a postcard, but that doesn't mean they're gonna type in the URL. So we thought, oh, you know something? If we actually take photos of people and post them online uh, through our website, then they'll actually like go to the website. So um, in exchange for their email, essentially, we took photos of them. And so I'm not sure. I think there was some turmoil in the Supreme Court at the time, and we thought it would be a good idea to mix the um, Supreme Court with the Muppets. Um, and so uh, we did that, and then um, Uncle Sam and Wonder Woman. And so we kind of did this at the flea. It's kind of like promotional stunts. We also had a peep show, um, which I, I have the video online. I can show you, like, I can send you the link. Uh, it was a conceptual peep show, um, which I'll just, I don't want to talk about that now. So, um, <laughs> and, then, and then for our last kind of moment at the flea, uh, the last month, we had like a make your own monument where we gathered all of the things that we had used over like six months at the flea and we, and we let people um, kind of make, assemble their own uh, kind of structure using these different things we had. Um, but so that that's just kind of like some of the some of the promotion we did. Uh, but let me show you a video. Let me show you kind of a video of of a walk we did the first season. Um, it's called Forever Twenty One. It's a pretty playful walk, and it was by Juan Bettencourt and me. And. We're in the heart of the Diamond District. Now you see it's nighttime. All the diamonds have been taken away. The cases are empty. Walk through the remainder of this street looking at your reflection. You are the diamonds. You are the ones that shine. Smile at yourself. We are in L'Oreal's headquarters for New York. This is also a public space. This is like a temple of beauty. Wear these glasses, look upwards, and bask in the glow. Everyone has their, is gonna have their moment to shine now. We're gonna go one at a time, and uh, we're gonna take your, your glamour shot. Come on, hold on. <laughs> Write down your individual secret for staying young. That's the mainstream uh, show, though. 
Yeah. Do you have any products for eternal youth? Eternal youth? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Clean right here is $225. It helps with the wrinkles that you may have now. It's for puffing these dark circles. And it helps prevent future damage. So you'll stay as you are. Can I try that? Absolutely. What we're attaching to our necklace are the secrets to eternal youth that everyone wrote down. Pass this necklace from one person to another to charge it with our energy. What we'd like to do now that this necklace is charged is to place the necklace inside of the store of Forever 21 to symbolize the false commercial promise of eternal youth. If we can have a participant who will take the necklace and place it alongside the necklace rack while we look through the windows, discreetly, of course, that would be great. Anyone want to do it? So at this time, I was still um, working a day job, and I decided to quit it to focus on Elastic City. Uh, I was working over at Pratt, um, and actually, uh, it's kind of wonderful what happened. Uh, I, was, I was there, I was working in the president's office, and, um, and I heard this voice, this guy came in, and I mean, his voice was completely recognizable, and I was like, Gavin? We had co-taught a sound workshop uh, in San Francisco together, you know, uh, years earlier, you know, six years earlier or something. And uh, he was taking a course at Pratt, and I was telling him I'm still doing the walks, and, and I'm, you know, I've started this organization. He said, well, you should give a walk for my class, a poetry class. And I said, all right. And I gave a walk for that class, and afterwards the professor was like, have you thought about teaching? I'm like, well, yeah. He's like, all right. So... The next thing I know, I have a teaching job uh, at Pratt, uh, undergrad writing, um, which lasted for a bit. And then, and then I went on a residency and all of a sudden lost my teaching job, but now have it back again in the MFA program. So it all worked out, but like coincidences and just like being at the right place, like these, I don't know. Um, so after quitting uh, Pratt, this office gig, I was able to focus a lot more on Elastic City. And, um, and in the next year, uh, as opposed to 11 artists, we had 21 artists lead walks. And this is in like, this was generally in like a six month season. Um, and most of the walks were in New York and we also had a walk in Sao Paulo. Um, and then we had Nigel Smith's uh, walk uh, in Detroit. And the walks started in New York and flew to Detroit. And this was, this is the walk I'll show you now. It's sort of a city I don't really know anything. I want to give some context. <laughs> I realize this, this, this will benefit from some context. <laughs> um, Nigel grew up in Detroit, uh, and, um, and he hadn't returned to Detroit in a while, and he had some shit he had to work out, and he thought, well, I'm gonna go back to Detroit, and I'm gonna invite people to come with me, and they're invited to bring their shit with them, and we're all gonna work it out together in Detroit. <laughs> all right. It's sort of a city I don't really know anything about, really. Um, except that there's this the loss of the industrial base. Otherwise, I don't really have a lot of expectations. I just wonder how 
what we're going to discover then. Hey, we're just turning the corner right now onto Lawton. We're at our first location, and um, you'll want to put on your comfortable walking shoes, Ma, because <laughs> uh, there'll be a little bit of climbing. It's 1862, and you've just arrived at the Lee Plaza Hotel, and you're expected to be at the opera tonight. And you're going to take your time, and you're going to peacock your way down the hall. I'm just being escorted by the two baddest women here. <laughs> I'm going to count to 20. Keep your pose. And on that count of 20, I want you to morph from 1862 to 2062 in your pose. One. Two, three, four. If you had to imagine this space 10 years ago, what would you imagine happening here? There used to be a blue house right here, and that house eventually burned down. We moved here uh, with Gary, um, and he did something he shouldn't have done. Uh, and. I wonder if that's one of the reasons I haven't been back here in so long. I think I want to talk about a moment of, of courage that I think my life is asking of me. Death frightens me. Losing the people that I love frightens me. I'd like to find a way to be okay with that, to let the fear go. This is a silent performance. It's completely silent. Using their bandanas, uh, they're going to touch Tracy, and they're going to hold the touch there. All I know of everybody in the group is, to a large extent, the experience of just being in the group, just doing what we did walking down the Woodward Avenue. After a while, I'm coming to feel as though I sort of know these people, but I really don't in this conventional sense. I do in another kind of sense, which is sort of tactile and, uh, and uh, visual. So everyone, we're going to Earthworks Urban Farm right now. Uh, and Earthworks Urban Farm is an extension of the Capuchin Soup Kitchen. I mean, people see these wonderful Mountain tops, you know, they never climb the mountain. They say, oh man, it's cold up there. There's nothing up there but ice and snow. But when they get up there, they see these beautiful little lush flowers that grows in high climates, you know, in cold temperatures, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? But once you touch and put that human touch to something, the whole thing just changes. <laughs> Just Steve, mm -hmm. just Steve, where shall we go? Yeah. Just Steve, I need to know where we need to go. <laughs> just Steve, you know where we need to go? Because yeah. I think you do, and you know, and you're going to tell me, right? Right. You know where we're going today in Detroit? Steve is just. You know? We've now carried each other, taken care of each other. Uh, we've reached out to others. Uh, and now I want us uh, to be in dialogue with the city. It's more the rising for me. Right. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, coming back. Right, you know, Detroit's you. being so uh, bright yeah. and glorious in the past. And right. we're down and everybody's kicking us. There is hope. If you knew how many communities are actually trying to pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, how many neighbors help each other out, there's a spirit here that you can't kill, and it's, we're not going away anytime soon. So get used to it. We're sticking around. Do you guys call it I know, right? I get right. Right. <laughs> I should mention that on that last day. Um, That's it. That was it. The last. We were wondering uh, where it is we were gonna go. Yeah, oh, sultry. Um, 
Nigel's grandmother made pop brownies, <laughs> which was a total surprise. And so we're at the Heidelberg Project. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally stoned on the piano. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, we have liability insurance. It's important. Um, it also helps other organizations partner with us. Um, so 2011 was a really nice year. Um, we also, uh, Jacob Gabry, who was here recently, uh, actually led a walk with him using Grindr. Um, and uh, the concept for that walk was that um, we would ask everyone to meet, I don't know, people know what Grindr is, probably some of you do. It's like a, it's an app that like you can find other people, uh, primarily gay men use it. Um, and, and all you really see is how far they are from you and then you could kind of send them a message. And so we thought over Gay Pride Weekend, uh, it'd be a good idea to like create this walk. The idea is that we would ask people to change their profile picture on Grindr uh, to the Elastic City logo. Um, and then we would just say that the walk begins at four o'clock in the East Village, but we didn't say where, but turn on Grindr. Um, and so conceptually, I really like, really like the walk, uh, except that like Grindr didn't really work <laughs> so well. And so um, we were kind of there like, you know, wondering like it wasn't updating people's profiles, pictures, and you know, it, it kind of reinforced the fact that using technology on these walks like generally you know, something, something usually will go wrong, whether it's like the iPod didn't charge, um, like even when it's really simple technology. Um, this was also a year when we got like kind of the best possible press we could have gotten. Um, Raj Chast, who's a cartoonist for The New Yorker, um, wrote this like two page spread on Elastic City and, um, and I'm still kind of in awe of it because she's, she's like a hero of mine. Um, so, uh, also at this point I was teaching a Pratt, uh, for the undergraduate writers. And so I, w I teach a course, the walk as poem and their final assignment is to lead a walk, um, and really explain their poetic decision-making behind everything that they do. Uh, and so, <coughs> excuse me, they started leading walks uh, and I promote them through the Elastic City site. Um, so 2012, we started Elastic City we started uh, our educational program consisting of artist-led participatory workshops. We call them WAYS. So artists offer walks and WAYS. And uh, we had 28 artists that led walks and WAYS throughout New York with sets of walks in San Francisco, um, in Berlin, in Buenos Aires, uh, in Paris, and uh, in Reykjavik. Um, and then we uh, ramped up our partnerships with organizations, um, um, the High Line, the Museum of the City of New York, and Printed Matter, and we became a 501c3, which was key. So at this point, I knew pretty early that like, yeah, I don't know how this thing is gonna make money, but I was like, I think we're a nonprofit. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's what we have to do. Uh, <laughs> so we became a nonprofit organization, and uh, I should just kind of stress, someone told me in, in the first year, um, Natalie Angles from Residency Unlimited, she's like, it's really important to make partnerships. And, uh, and it's true. I mean, outside of helping with visibility and just like expanding the audience, um, it's really good to connect and create and make community with local, with like people in the art world. Um, I've always kind of been a little uncomfortable having both feet in the art world. And I work with artists who some don't identify as artists but I think everyone's an artist. So uh, I should say I think everyone's an artist because we, we make decisions with our lives and they have potential to be creative ones, whether it's like what we name the file on our desktop um, to anything that's in our control. Um, so, so yeah, so making partnerships. Uh, if they don't involve money, generally very easy. And when money's involved, it's hard. Um, if we want someone to give us money, it's better that they come to us. You know, I think like people want to know that they've discovered you. Uh, it's kind of like dating. Um, so, anyway, now I'll talk about uh, 
kind of how, how I work with artists to create their walks. Um, maybe I'll pick a new slide. Yeah. So, so generally, um, uh, people can write in and request, you know, essentially like send a proposal or an idea for a walk. And, uh, or, and or, like I also reach out to artists too. Primarily I reach out and I curate the artists. And so usually the artist has a concept in mind or um, they have a starting location. And it's usually that the concept, this, like the concept that they have um, ends up creating the starting location or the starting location, that area ends up like uh, working into the concept. So for instance, Eve Mosher gave a walk in the Rockaways uh, after Sandy, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, and it was on, she knew she wanted to work in the Rockaways. And so we worked around like the concept of loss, about personal loss, collective loss, and like physical, like the, the loss from climate change. Um, or Nigel, who just gave the, the video you saw on the Detroit walk, uh, he went to DC and noticed that like, there are all these like statues to like old white men. He was like, they don't speak to me. So he came back to New York and went around City Hall area and decided he was gonna give monument a walk. The idea where we make our own monuments uh, in response to the monuments in public space. And that's both like the monuments that you see, like the, the more figurative ones and then the more abstract ones as well. So, so generally I ask an artist, you know, what do you want to explore? Uh, what's urgent for you? That's like a real key question, like what's urgent for you? Um, and then also what can you do with a group that you might not be able to do by yourself? And then uh, route design. So like literally designing the route that we take. Um, I would I'd say that like, you might need to know that you have to like start or end at a given place, or you know that there's one thing that you need to do, um, and then you can build the walk around those parameters. So I usually like say to the artist, go and survey a place, like follow your curiosity, follow your eye, what's strange or sticks out. Look at the signs and the graffiti and the pedestrian behavior. Uh, print out a map and draw on it or take notes in the form that's best for you. Taking photos is helpful too. And then in planning a route, I think it's like good practice, like try not to retrace your footsteps. Um, it's not interesting unless it's specifically part of the concept. Uh, and I think at least for, for urban walks, for like city walks, you don't really wanna walk more than a block without doing something. I kind of think that this walk form, it's kind of like a pop song. It's like, you know, it's best in, in a way that it's like concentrated. Um, personally, I'm not such a fan of like the real durational walks, like where someone walks, uh, you know, <laughs> forever or like on and on. There's like a machismo to it that I, I can't really get behind personally. Like I think it could be really strong, but the kind of walks that, that Elastic City commissions are generally shorter, more concentrated, and that someone really stays in the work. I think it's important to like keep, keep the focus. Um, so I, I'll also uh, ask the artist to, to make a timeline. Um, I mean, I re I'll ask them to, whether they do, <laughs> it's a whole other thing. And that uh, to estimate that things will take shorter than you think they will. Um, it's better to plan more things if you need to and then cut them than to have to like stretch things out to fill time. We had a walk that was slated to be 90 minutes and like at 60 minutes it was done. And like I noticed it and I don't know if like other people did. And the next day I get an email uh, from someone who was on the walk who's like, well, this walk was like 60 minutes. And so uh, I gave her her money back. Um, in the past we have charged for walks um, and uh, now we don't, but I'll get to that. Um, also the arc, like the arc of the walk. I think of it kind of like a narrative, like a story. Um, like one can structure it however they want, but to keep in mind your audience, which might be different from other types of art making, but like really this is participatory, so you have to anticipate uh, what someone might, you have to anticipate like a wide range of reactions. So um, if you want someone to do something, like one might need some foundation or a warm up to get them on board. And uh, 
I always suggest that the artists presume that they're gonna have the worst possible participant, which like are generally journalists and curators, um, and then figure that you'll have to warm people up somehow. Um, I think that uh, also like it's, it's good not to do the best thing first, because then it's downhill. Um, and after like a particularly strenuous or emotional moment, it's good to relax a bit. So you wanna think about the pace of the walk. It's kind of similar like the word choice or punctuation in a poem. You wanna make something purposeful. It's like um, you wanna be able at least to yourself to explain every decision you've made. Um, even if you have some sort of like strange way of how you got there, so long as you can justify it to yourself. It's just a good way to check what needs to be on the walk. In that way, it's kind of minimal. Um, so again, I, I would say if one finds themselves struggling to make the connection between events or why we're doing something, then it's probably best, not definitely, but probably best not to include it. Um, and then if you want people to go along with you, you have to take care of them. So you have to really make people feel safe, feeling vulnerable. Um, a bunch of things that artists have offered to a group on a walk. I have like a whole list here. I, I'm actually leading a walk on, uh, I'm leading two walks on Thursday. I'll, I have the dates later on in this document. I'll tell you them later. But um, you know, we might play the skyline as a score. Um, when there's a phone, if we pass by a pay phone, we might end up, I might end up asking someone, you know, to call or text or email someone and tell them you love them. Um, we may make a composition just by like moving our ears, a composition for ourselves. We do things with our eyes closed. Um, let's see, we might go into a supermarket and just play the sounds of the supermarket together. Um, we might make a jingle or a theme song for a local business. Uh, you know, we might build an imaginary campfire, do lucky rituals. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, and then kind of like how you ask someone to participate. I think that it's really good to offer. You offer prompts, you offer suggestions, you don't force it, uh, and don't assume. It's like you, you have to invite and offer someone an out also. Um, I usually mention this at the beginning of the walk, and then I don't mention it again, <laughs> but uh, I usually mention at the beginning, like if something is, if, if this is participatory, but if you don't feel like participating, you don't have to, you can step back. I don't want to keep mentioning it, because then I don't want people to, to not do it. Um, I, ask the, I ask the artist, you know, your tone should be like friendly and confident and understanding, and to be yourself, it's really not like, not really acting. Um, unless the act is part of the walk. Uh, we have rehearsals, um, usually like one or two at least, um, not too many more. The whole thing is like also, I can't pay a ton of money to the artists, but with more money I could ask more of them too. So I'm always careful of like, you know, how much time, I mean it could take me 40 hours to create a walk, you know, split up over months or, or longer. Um, I hesitate to say that to the artist sometimes because I don't want to scare them. But, uh, and then there's some sort of like logistics. For instance, um, do you want people to shut off or silence their phone? Uh, can people talk on the walk or like only when it's urgent? Um, I ask everyone to count the participants on a walk. Um, not to lose the group. <laughs> if you're walking and feel like you can't see everyone behind you, then maybe you're too far ahead. If you wear sunglasses, like just know that that lessens intimacy. Um, and then like if they're ever disruptive people, you know, you might wanna walk into a building or something to just kinda like get them away um, and stick to the allotted time. So, and uh, also a rain plan. Generally the walks are rain or shine unless the weather is like dangerous or unless the weather in some way like will really impact the walk. But statistically that happens very rarely. Usually the walks go on. Um, and then preparation, I ask the artist to arrive early to the walk location and like walk the route because cause that place you went to last week in rehearsal like might be different. Um, I had a walk that like relied on the sound of an air conditioner <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, get there and I was like, shit, the air conditioner is not on. 
and the walk isn't like 15 minutes, <laughs> you know, so I had to come up with something else. Um, anyway, so in 2012, when we had all of these artists leading walks, it got too big. Um, it was too much. And I was like, well, is the quality of the work suffering? I was like, there are too many artists. I need to like scale this back. So, because that was like, I think something like 30 artists in 2012. So in 2013, we had about 20 artists uh, with walks in New York and in Wilmington, in Mexico City, Montreal, and Tokyo. And we launched our poetic activist arm, willing participant, um, with the help from the New Museum's Education Department. And willing participant, as Ara said, whips up urgent poetic responses to crazy shit that happens. And uh, this is kind of our, our website. We're still, I think it's still getting off the ground. Um, we decided after the Trayvon Martin verdict, um, we, kind of, the way willing participant works briefly is that um, we get people together like very quickly. We like send out a call and we're like, hey, we're gonna get together to talk about this. And, we're, and we have like a four hour meeting and we distill that meeting into like, it's almost like into, into this statement. Um, and then the ringleaders of Willing Participant, me, uh, Nigel and Ben, we go off and design a performance that will happen within the coming days around this statement. And then we invite the public and anyone else, you know, anyone who wants to join to be part of it. And with the Trevon Martin verdict, we realized that like, all right, the public needs to respect the lives of young black men. That's like, that's what we had come up with like as a group. And so we created this performance where we would process um, and we wanted to do it at night uh, because that was when we thought that this would have most impact, but we wanted a place that was, uh, had a lot of audience where there'd be a lot of people at night. So we we're like Times Square. <laughs> so we decided to do something in Times Square when like all the Broadway shows get out. So it's like 1030 at night or so. And so we processed, there were about 35, 40 of us, processed into Times Square all wearing hoodies, the hoodie being kind of like the iconic like marker, I should say, of, of, the, like, of everything around this. And um, we processed into Times Square and we kind of walked slowly from one sidewalk to another and then would freeze into place with like with another version of like the hooded self, the idea that the hooded the hooded self has many personalities, um, you know, and so we would freeze into place into this this kind of um, character of sorts, freeze there and then walk to the other side, walk back, freeze there. We did that for like twenty minutes, um, and then we recessed out of Times Square. Uh, and so, let me show you one more video. And this is a walk uh, called Spread. And I led this in, in uh, collaboration with Nigel. And this was for Visual AIDS. Visual AIDS provides resources to HIV positive artists. And basically when like, a lot of artists started dying of AIDS uh, in the 80s, there was no, like, their, their families maybe had abandoned them, but there was nowhere for their artwork to go. And so this organization stepped in and helped create an archive for their work. And so they were celebrating their 25th anniversary and they wanted to commission Elastic City to give a walk. And so we're like, <laughs> all right, how do we do this? Um, to like acknowledge the 25th anniversary of this amazing organization, to celebrate their community of survivors, um, to acknowledge this virus that's taken so many lives, to create something site specific and in the present. So it was like a tall order. Um, so we decided to work with the virus as metaphor. And, uh, and so this walk is called Spread. On this walk, we're going to investigate the language and actions of spreading. We're going to push upon the limits of how we spread ourselves, our secrets and desires in public. Imagine for a moment that Todd has in his hands a warm, squishy ball. We're going to toss that ball around. 
Now what we'd like to do is to welcome people who didn't join the walk. Pair up in groups of two, come up here onto our stage, and you're going to spread that gesture until you're acknowledged by people who pass by. We're at uh, Pink Town, where you accessorize your life. I'd like to invite everyone in the group to actually take a moment to spread your pride. In this public plaza, we are now free to reveal ourselves. Nigel has graciously volunteered to show us one way of doing this. Uh, oh, no, it's legal. No, 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 no. We have, we have the law in our box. No, 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 pockets. you got to keep your shirt on. No, no, we have a law. It's no, not no. a defense. You can't Sir, arrest you us show me you're ignorant of the I'm law. Not, I'm not a police officer. Okay. Well, then, then our I'm a security guard. Okay. Also, we're in our privately owned public space. You might as well bust through the water if you really want to show out. <laughs> you know, you're going to be brave. <laughs> yeah, you can't go for a less yeah. like you. Yeah, that's it. You keep that kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's a good start. You know, I'm not trying to, like, stop you with anything that you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. It's your freedom of speech. It's your right to yeah. do whatever you want. Yeah. We want to let out our anxiety or just let out, like, the tension of that last moment. All right, one, two, three. Ah! Now that we've had a moment to meditate on what it is we'd like to spread out into the world, we'd like to ask you to actually put that visualization onto a post-it note. <laughs> Todd and I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to move as a virus might move. The first person at the end of the line is going to turn in to the person next to them. And using their eyes, and only their eyes, they're going to replicate what's inside of them. They're going to offer it over. They're going to download it. They're going to push it into the person they're looking at. We're going to walk up into DVD Explosion Go into a booth, close the door, and then spread something to someone next to you. That could be physically, that could be textually. Offer something to someone. Excuse me. Excuse me. No ladies. No ladies. I think you were out here for maybe like three or four minutes while we were all able to spread something and receive something. Uh, and I, for one, think that that's pretty unfair. One at a time, those of us who have something to offer to you, and one word, will step forward and give you that word. We are in front of New York's only 24-hour post office. And so now, I think we have another round for them. Well, this is a photocopy from before. Let's send this to someone. What if we send it to visual aids? Oh, we could oh, send it to visual, visual aids. aids. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, so during that year as well, we, uh, we also had our first benefit. Hey -o. And uh, we had a photo booth. We kind of queered the idea of a photo booth. That's Raj Chast, actually, in the middle uh, there. We had a green screen. And, um, and so people would pose in front of the green screen, but they didn't know what was behind them until later. And, uh, <laughs> Benjamin Fredrickson is the photographer, and he put some of his own personal shots uh, in the back. Um, so kind of keeping in this idea of Elastic City as a project, like this is really, uh, you know, everything, we like to kind of queer things in a way, like everything has the, the, the opportunity or the possibility to be you know, like pushed on. Um, it was also during this year that, uh, that I gave a walk over at MoMA around the Magritte exhibition. Um, and that we had walks at the New Museum uh, as part of uh, their 1993 exhibition. Um, and uh, let's see. So this year, being the fifth year of Elastic City, well, I should say that in the winter I had this moment of like, man, this is really tough. And uh, like, it's hard to make money with this. 
a lot of doors have opened, but it's hard to make money, and I was getting really down on myself about it. Um, you know, what should I do? Should I should I abandon this? Should I like, I don't know, go become a Gestalt therapist? Um, I was really questioning things, uh, and then the sun came out, and I started to feel better. But uh, but in that moment, um, I was planning this year and decided, you know. What if I just play with the form more and let's concentrate it? Let's, as opposed to like a six to eight month season, let's concentrate it into 12 days. And so we created a festival with um, this time eight different walks led by artists uh, such as uh, Karen Finley and Anthony, Anthony Glycolia, Michelle Groisman, um, Amachai Lau Levy, Sarah Schulman. Um, and so we, we created this festival this year. and. It just, it just ended, and so I'm still <laughs> recovering from it. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, we had a walk called Downside Up, which was led by an aerial artist, Kristen Young, that literally, it's like if we orient ourselves differently, like physically change how we orient ourselves in the city, how will that change our perspectives of the city? The walk actually ended up in her aerial arts studio, and we ended up like climbing ropes and being upside down. Um, we had a walk, we had our first walk that actually didn't really move. Uh, it stayed in the same location by Michelle Groisman. Um, it was actually amazing. The Times came on this one, a dance critic from the Times, and, and they wrote a favorable review. Uh, this was, um, he had us like, essentially using this, this, this machine over here. Two people can draw, um, but they both had to be in sync in order for the pen to actually hit the paper, um, and they couldn't talk to one another. Um, so it was really a way of like moving through space together. Um, it was a gorgeous walk. And then he also had this, these, they look like these plastic bags that um, they're connected. There's, each person has a plastic bag and there's a wire from one plastic bag to another. So as you would squeeze it, the other person's bag would inflate. And so it was really gorgeous. It was really intimate. Um, and then this is a walk by Karen Finley around Columbus Circle, this idea that um, Columbus Circle is a mandala and, uh, and it's been kind of taken over by corporate interests. And so we kind of like dissected that. Um, and at one moment we went into Central Park and created uh, kind of videos of the trees. And then there was actually like a natural mandala in the subway tiles down under Columbus Circle and we put it there. Um, and then Anthony Glycolia, who's a photographer, took us out again involving a van uh, into the woods upstate, people were blindfolded, um, which generally I'm like not a fan of blindfolding if we're walking, because it's too dangerous. Like, but people were in a van and blindfolded, so it was different. And then, uh, and then he he essentially created a photo shoot um, upstate. And then we had a walk by Amichai Lavi and Sean Schaffner uh, for the. There's a Jewish ritual called Tashlik. and uh, it's like a shedding ritual for the New Year, where you get rid of, you literally empty your your uh, pockets of breadcrumbs um, with using like breadcrumbs or lint to kind of cast away like your sins of the last year. And so this went from Hell's Kitchen over to the water. Um, and, uh, and we also had our first series of talks on the walk form. And so we had uh, four different talks on like the history of the walk form, the politics of the walk form, uh, the walk is a new performative framework, and then this idea of like impossibility in participatory performance, and Pratt uh, co-sponsored that. And now I'm just kind of really eager to push on what a talk can be. Um, that's kind of the next thing I think Elastic City is going to do. Um, and we got our first grants, thank God. Uh, so from the city and from Foundation for Contemporary Arts and Asylum Arts. And so this year, I kind of led with my politics, which was like, I want to make all the walks free, and I want to pay the artists a lot more. So I did that, and I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. And then the grant money came in crazy, like literally the day before we announced the festival, the first grant came in. And then I think it was like the day before the first walk began, like the city money came in. So like, man, that just that saved things. Um, and then we just had a benefit last week. And so we, uh, again, kind of playing with this idea of what a benefit could be. We had these, like, we had it in, in this gallery 
in, in Soho, um, and then we had performances happen outside, and then we also had mimes come in, uh, and we had mimes kind of infiltrate the event for an hour. Um, so as for next year, I think we'll, I, I wanna create a longer festival. Um, I think that 12 days is too much, is, is I'm sorry, too, it's too concentrated, and I kind of felt like I needed to conquer the festival as opposed to live in it. And so I think we'll have a longer festival um, and continue with the talks. Because basically, like, this, it's, you know, these walks are like ephemeral and experimental and free and intimate. I mean, it's a dream. Um, it's a dream, and it's, and it's taken me here and, like, continues to open doors. Um, it's a long-term project, and it's, like, slow-growing, and it continues to reward. Um, so I would just say for those who who dream big with perhaps like far-fetched ideas um, or impractical ones, like just do it. Like don't sit on it too long. Um, you'll find, like you'll, you'll work your way through it. So that's that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I should mention